Now, by this time in the narrative God, the big God with a big, big beard, sitting upon his throne in the clouds in heaven, was bored to tears. He was scratching the bottom of his feet whilst he was trying to study geometry, whilst the late-night television program went off air only to be replaced by an advertisement for a male enhancement product. And whilst all this was going on, God was also watching a YouTube video series in which an ex-Christian agnostic fellow was reading the book of Joshua in a literal but comical manner, desperately trying to entertain his viewers by recounting tales written in this 3,000-year-old book of stupid. But God was bored stiff and did consider sending a plague upon the state of Arkansas and upon the students of the university thereof at Fort Smith. But fortunately, he reconsidered at the last minute, because God knows, because he knows everything, that in chapter 6 of the book of Joshua, we finally get to the good part. Now Jericho was straightly shut up because of the children of Israel, and the people of Jericho feared a band of kids walking around the walls of their city, their parents nowhere to be found. None went out and none came in, for there was a bomb threat called into the gates of the city, and the police department did tell the people of Jericho not to go anywhere until such time as they did determine that the call came from one of those bratty little kids walking around the outside of the city. And the Lord said unto Joshua, See! And Joshua said unto him, See what? And Joshua turned around and looked unto the face of the Lord, and the Lord did show unto Joshua a mouthful of chewed food that he did salve on his tongue. And Joshua said unto the Lord, Really now, that's just disgusting. And God, having swallowed the food and having promised to behave himself from this point on, said unto Joshua, I have given unto thine hand Jericho, and the king thereof, and the mighty men of valor, and you shall go out into the middle of the field and play a game of football. And Joshua answered and said unto the Lord, And what kind of football would that be? European football or real football? And the Lord said, Why, European football, oh bloody hell, just play soccer. And ye shall come to the city, all ye, hey, are you writing this down? <sighs> Get out your notepad and pen and start taking notes. It's imperative that you do this exactly the way I tell you. And Joshua said, Oh, I'm sorry, where did I put my notepad? Oh, here we go. Uh, continue, please. And God said, mm, Very well. Compass the city, all ye men of war, and go around the city once. And thou shalt do this on foot, in that thou shalt not have access to tanks, humvees, or armored personnel carriers. Thus shall you do six days. And seven priests shall bear before the ark of the Lord seven ram's horns. Uh, wait, 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 said Joshua. Is that one horn apiece, or seven horns for each of them? I need these types of details so that I may get this exactly right. But the Lord did not answer him. And the seventh day you shall compass the city seven times, which is an awful lot of walking, such that all the soldiers shall complain that their feet hurt, and the rucksacks are digging into their shoulders, and may they please sit down for a moment to rest, all except for the 11 Bravo infantrymen, particularly those of the 9th Infantry Regiment of Camp Kitsi, Korea, who shall unilaterally complain that the march is not nearly long enough for them to even break us to sweat, and shall all admonish one another to keep up the fire. And the priests shall blow the trumpets, seven priests playing seven trumpets, and belting out a classic Louis Armstrong jazz song, we shall keep up the spears of their fellow soldiers. And just like a Kenyan marathon runner who gave the white guy a two-hour head start just to be nice to him, it shall come to pass that when they, they being the priests at this point, make a long blast with the ram's horn, having finished their Louis Armstrong jazz set, and when ye hear the sound of the trumpet, all the people shall shout with a great shout, for the music was fantastic, and they shall want the priests to play an encore. And in a completely coincidental happenstance unrelated to the Jans concert playing in a venue outside the walls of Jericho, that an earthquake shall suddenly occur and the wall of the city shall fall down flat, and the people shall ascend, every man straight before him. For they shall attack the city of Jericho at the time when they are the most vulnerable, 
and at no time shall they question whether it is moral to attack and kill innocent people when they should be sending in medical professionals to help attend to those who were injured in the earthquake. And Joshua, the son of Anun, Moses' minister, called the priests and sent to them, Take up the Ark of the Covenant, and tell Harrison Ford that he is not allowed to look inside it. And let seven priests bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the Ark of the Lord. And when the priest raised up his hand and asked Joshua, Is that seven trumpets per priest, or one trumpet for each of them? Because truth be told, I don't believe our band actually owns forty-nine trumpets. But Joshua gave unto him no answer. And he said unto the people, Pass on, and compass the city, and let him that is armed pass before the ark of the Lord. And Joshua set down a lawn chair, and sat back with a glass of pink lemonade, and watched the children of Israel conduct their march about the walls of the city. And the priests gave unto themselves very nervous looks, as they were not entirely certain about the efficacy of this particular battle plan. And in the headquarters of the Jericho City Police Department, the chief of police walked over to his dispatcher, and he tried to find out why his eyes were glued to the closed-circuit television monitor. Well, what's all this then, he asked. Have you finished the paperwork on that bomb threat yet, Sergeant? And he snapped to attention, saluted, and said, Chief, I am still waiting for the Department of Canaan Land Security to return my phone call. But right now, I'm quite concerned about this video feed on this monitor. Oh, really? Whatever could be going on that might be more important than the bomb threat? The people of the city are still shut up, and none can go out, and none can enter in. Get on that! Now, as they were walking over to the monster, we see that on another television, the Kenyan runner was about to overtake the white guy, for he was not running nearly as fast and would ultimately lose the race regardless of his two-hour head start, and it came to pass. When Joshua had spoken unto the people, that the seven priests bearing the seven trumpets of ram's horns passed on before the Lord, and blew with the trumpets, and the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord followed them, and Harrison Ford and Gimli the dwarf, and two German Nazis followed after the Ark, and Harrison Ford did tell them to keep their eyes shut. And the armed men went before the priests that blew with the trumpets, and they had flags flying, and boots stamping on the ground, and the infantrymen did show all the other stupid pogues how to conduct a proper tactical road march. And the rearward came after the ark, including the cooks, the medics, the fuel trucks, the pencil pushers, the mechanics, the visiting sender, the old lady selling fresh food out of her trailer, the priests going on, blowing with the trumpets, playing an upbeat Louis Armstrong song. And the soldiers were all thoroughly entertained. And Joshua, sitting on the salon chair, had commanded the people, saying, Ye shall not shout, nor make any noise with their voice, neither shall any word proceed out of your mouth until the day which I bid you shout. Then you shall shout. So the soldiers marched on, giving each other hand and arm signals, written messages, smoke signals, email messages, semaphore flag waving, and Morse code signals with the portable Aldous lamp. And in this week did the only Israeli mime in recorded history do very brisk business. So the Ark of the Lord compassed the city, going about at once, and they came into the camp and lodged in the camp in the roadside motel for $35 a night. And Joshua, the son of a nun, rose up early in the morning, ate breakfast, and read the newspaper article about the fantastic jazz festival that was in progress outside the walls of Jericho, and decided to keep it up for, say, a week or so, and perhaps they should close out the festival with a gigantic explosive bash at the end of the week. And he told this idea to the priests. But the priests objected to the idea, for if the soldiers were to march around the city every day for seven days, then most assuredly one of these days would wind up being the Sabbath day. Surely to work on the Sabbath day violates the law of Moses. But then they reconsidered, for in the book that already violates the commandments not to murder, not to steal, not to bear false witness, to work on the Sabbath day really wasn't that big of a deal. And the priest took up the Ark of the Lord, and Harrison Ford told the people to avert their eyes. And seven priests bearing seven ram's horns, each before the Ark of the Lord, went on continually, and blew the trumpets, this time playing patriotic John Philip Sousa songs. And the armed men went before them, looking as strong and silent as they were the day before. But the rearward came after the Ark of the Lord, still wondering why they had to repeat this whole entire event again, the priests going on blowing with the trumpets. 
And the second day they encompassed the city once and returned to the camp, because they had heard that the king of Jericho had challenged them to a game of football. So they did six days. And the white guy was still running along in the marathon and thought he was ahead. But he began to hear some footsteps of another runner behind him. He tried to run faster, but it was to no avail. In a flash, the Kenyan runner had overtaken him and left him in a trail of dust. The white guy, trying to catch his breath, swiftly calculated the estimated speed of his fellow marathon runner and surmised that he must have been going about 75% of the speed of light. So there was little doubt in his mind that this Kenyan counterpart came to pass on the seventh day that they rose early about the dawning of the day, and after eating breakfast and screaming loudly at the top of their lungs just to get out of their system, they stood in line to begin the day's road march. And the rearward soldiers did complaint like little sissy schoolgirls, and when their commanders did not hearken unto them, they did write angry letters to their congressmen. But the ninth infantry soldiers at the front of the line had a different complaint altogether, that compassing the city seven times in a single day still wasn't a long enough road march to suffice them, and thought that this endeavor would have an adverse effect on their overall physical fitness prowess, and vowed into themselves on this day that they would hit the gym later and lift some weights. And they compassed the city after the same manner seven times. Only on that day compassed the city seven times, which is a rather odd statement in that the text repeats the same exact phrase it had just stated causing the same level of mental absurdity that Paul C. Hartley experienced whilst reading through Kent Hovind's alleged doctoral thesis. And the Kenyan fellow running the marathon, oh, bugger it all. I had envisioned yet another non-sequitter scene to be inserted at this point to demonstrate how the marathon runner had given everybody a two-hour head start for the specific purpose of passing everybody. But come on, two times on one screen? So let's not kid ourselves. You know what I'm about to say. You see it there on your screen. Say it with me now. One, two, three. It came to pass. At the seventh time, when the priests blew with the trumpets, which somehow was completely different from every other time they blew the trumpets during this entire chapter, uh, perhaps they were playing a different song, I don't know, Joshua said unto the people, Shout, for the Lord hath given you this city. And the city shall be accursed, even it and all that are therein, to the Lord. And it shall be one of those places that shall consist of gray, dilapidated buildings set in a foggy background, with trees with no leaves, and a few crows flying about hither and thither. And an old skinny farmer shall stop Fred in the mystery machine, and tell him and his friends to leave the city at once, for there is a curse on it. And Fred shall say to the others in the van, Well, gang, it looks like we have a mystery on our hands. And Scooby-Doo shall say that he'll do it for a Scooby Snack. Only Rahab the harlot shall live, though in other parts of this overall book of stupid it shall say that harlot shall be stoned to death. But in this case, she shall live, she and all that are with her in the house, because she did hid the messengers that we sent, even though we actually sent two spies, Barrett and Cloud, who by no definition at all whatsoever ought to be identified as messengers. And ye in any wise keep yourselves from the accursed thing, lest ye make yourselves accursed, when ye take of the accursed thing, and make the camp of Israel a curse, and trouble it, which doesn't mean a whole hell of a lot right now, but shall become more important in later chapters. And the Lord shall be pleased with me that the word accursed was repeated enough times in this verse. But all the silver and the gold, and vessels of brass and iron, are consecrated unto the Lord. They shall come into the treasury of the Lord, so that this military operation may ultimately pay for itself. So the people shouted when the priests blew with the trumpets, because as everybody knows, good soldiers never show emotions unless they are ordered to do so. And it came to pass, oh bugger all, if I'm going to do one of those scenes again. When all the people heard the sound of the trumpet, and the people shouted with a great shout, and there was, quite incidentally, a great earthquake from the tiny, imperceptible fault line that seismologists say exists in the Palestine area, and the wall fell down flat. And certainly that's how it happened, that the wall fell down like a drawbridge, allowing the Israelites easy access to the city, instead of crumbling downward into a heap of rocks that the soldiers would have to climb over. And of course, any archaeologist would take you directly to the historical site and show you that the evidence shows that this event happened exactly the way the Bible describes. 
So the people went up into the city, every man straight before him, and they took the city, and absolutely no one thought that what they were doing was obviously objectively immoral, that any person in the right mind would send in doctors to help the wounded, as we have previously described. But of course, God commanded them to do this, at least that's what Joshua told them, so anything that God commands must therefore be moral. And of course, as everybody knows, the Bible is the ultimate source of morality, full of transcendent statements such as to honor one's mother and father and not to kill. And this means that if the Bible is to be taken literally, the following is one of those verses that either doesn't actually exist or contains a command that we are all supposed to follow, even in modern society. And they utterly destroyed all that was in the city, both man and woman, young and old, and ox and sheep and ass, with the edge of the sword. I'm not even going to make a joke about this verse. To be perfectly honest, there's nothing to joke about. What am I supposed to say? How am I supposed to dress this up and make it look pretty? It's one thing to mock these allegedly holy scriptures by reading these verses in a comedic manner. But in this case, and I'm sure this is not the only verse like this in this book of stupid, when we can toss out the Bible altogether, just come to terms with what this verse actually says. They utterly destroyed everyone, men and women, young children, elderly people, and the cattle. They didn't just kill the soldiers who would, quite understandably, of course, be standing by to defend their homes. They also killed innocent people within the city in an act of unmitigated hatred and intolerance for other people. And what excuse do people use? What is the apologetic argument? God told them to, therefore it was moral. The problem is, of course, that you religious people don't even read your own Bibles. Well, anyway, on to more positive verses, as if there was anything written in this book of stupid of any redeeming value. But Joshua, the son of a nun, had said unto the two men that it spied out the country, bared in cloud, not promoted to the status of messengers, go into the harlot's house and be sure to ask her how much, and bring out thence the woman and all that she has as she swear unto her. And the two men that were spies, buried in cloud, went in and came into Rahab's house, which was fairly remarkable at this point. After all, if the Bible is to be taken literally, and Rahab's house was on top of the wall, as it says in chapter 2, and the wall just fell down flat, that this means that Rahab's house was now hovering in mid-air with nothing underneath it. And they brought out Rahab, and her father and her mother, and her brethren, and her next-door neighbor, and the milkman and the pet goat, and a mysterious man in the green silk cloak, and the customer that happened to be calling on Rahab's services at that particular time, and all that she had, and they brought them out her kindred, and left them without the camp of Israel. And people thought upon this verse and realized a very important lesson. The very best way to earthquake-proof one's home is to tie a scarlet ribbon on the outside of one's window. And they burnt the city with fire and all that was therein, which doesn't seem to be a very effective method of destroying a city made mostly of stone. I mean, haven't these Israelites ever played Pokemon? Only the silver, the gold, and the vessels of brass and iron they put into the treasury of the house of the Lord, so that the military operation may pay for itself. And Joshua saved Rahab the harlot alive, and did tell her which tent was his, and how much he was willing to pay. Hint, hint in her father's household and all that she had, and she dwelleth in Israel even unto this day, for she is a three thousand year old Nant El Druids from Darnessa City, because she hid the messengers or spies, which Joshua sent out to spy out or deliver a message unto Jericho. And Joshua adjured them at that time, saying, Cursed be the man before the Lord that rises up and buildeth this city Jericho, no matter how skilled the architect is or how modern the new buildings will be. He shall lay the foundation thereon in his firstborn, and in his youngest shall set the, up the gate of it. Now, this may not make much sense to many people unless they realize that this means exactly what it seems to. They buried young children alive in large pottery jars built into the walls as they were building them. Yes, this is an act of human sacrifice. So the Lord was with Joshua, and his fame was noised throughout all the country, as all the people talked about the outdoors jazz festival that was interrupted by a giant earthquake. And the Kenyan runner easily crossed the finish line once again in record time. 
He then stopped, checked his watch, and determined that it was time to go grab a quick bite to eat, as the marathon was so easy that he barely even broke a sweat. The white guy, far behind him, eventually crawled to the end of the track, trembling with furious exhaustion and barely able to hold his head up, as he finally crossed the finish line two hours later. Up to the walls of Jericho, smart gone in and hang. Go blow me, my heart can't die to wait. The battle is in my head. Hallelujah! And that the text repeats the same exact phrase it had just stated, causing the same level of mental absurdity that Paul C. Hartley experienced while reading the causing the same level of mental absurdity that's causing the same level of mental absurdity that causing the same level of mental absurdity that causing the same level of mental absurdity causing the same level of mental absurdity that Paul C. hardly experienced while reading through Kent Hovind's alleged doctoral thesis. <laughs>